العلم أشراف مطلب وطالبه لله أكرام من يمشي على قادم العلم نور مبين يستضيء به أهل السعادات والجهال في الظلم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين طيب إن line 45 the sheikh says rahmatullahi alayhi wa kullum mashghulin fala yushaghalu mithaluhu almarhun wal musabbal tayyib wa kullu mashghulin fala yushaghal the one who is or everything that is preoccupied should not be occupied further so if something is bu- if someone is busy with something or is occupied with something then they shouldn't be occupied further. And the Sheikh mentioned an example for al marhun al-Rahan, the endowment, or the Musabbal. <coughs> the meaning of this qaida is if a person is doing a certain ibadah or a certain metal and transaction, then they cannot be occupied with something else. For example, if you hire someone to do DIY for you and you say to them I'm going to pay you from 6 a.m. up until 6 p.m. I'm going to pay you for a whole day and you need to build me method and build a shed for me from 6 to 6 if you're paying him for the time and you're saying from 6 to 6 I'm paying you to build me a shed between this time, 6 and 6, this individual can't do anything else. He can't go out and work or work for someone else or build something for someone else. Why? Because he is mashghul, he is busy with this action. Or he's busy with this transaction. Likewise, if you say to him, Matalan, from 6 to 12, I want you to build this for me. Between 6 to 12, Taban, he gets it done. Like in between 6 and 12, he can't go out and do any other work because he's, also, he's already occupied with the work that he's carrying out for this individual. Like in if a person says, I'll give you a week to build me a shed. Is that the same as the previous one? Why not? He has to do it by the end of the week. There's a certain time limit. Like in... You haven't specified the time for him and when he should do it. The Sheikh mentioned in the example for the Murhun, al Rahan, or endowment, or al Musabbal, which is al Waqf. For example, al Waqf now. Al Waqf is that thing that a person pays fi sabilillah, for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's sake. So, for example, you say, I build this masjid for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Or, I leave this house, or I build this house for. Orphans. So if a person builds مثلا, a masjid, Lillahi subhanahu wa ta'ala, that masjid is waqf. He can't turn around some years later and say, the area is booming now, there's a lot of people, I'm going to destroy the masjid and make a, a tower block so I can get more money from renting out the flats. He's not allowed to do so. Why? Because this item, at this particular moment, this masjid is waqf. So if something is waqf, it is mashghul, it is busy with in the sabil of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, fi sabilillah. Also a rahan, for example. Or methan orphans, when you want to build an orphanage. You've built methan a house, and you say that house is only for orphans. Sometime later, you can't turn around and say, I'm going to change it from being an orphanage to, uh, a youth club. Or, uh, a masjid. You can't change it. Why? Because it is waqf lillahi subhanahu wa ta'ala. Also, marhun. Endowment or rahan is, مثلاً, if you, if you go to buy an item, and you don't have cash on you, You've gone to buy an item, a, a new phone, مثلاً, 
Like you forgot your card at home. You've forgotten your card at home. If you leave an item with the person up, up until you go and get your wallet. So for example, you say to him, I leave my watch with you. I, I leave my watch with you. I'm going to go home and get my card or cash. It's like a deposit that you've left. You can't now turn around and sell this watch because you've already left it with the person who owns the item that you was meant to be paying for. So you can't go and be with your friend and say, you know the watch that I've left in that shop? Yeah, it's yours. Go and take it. Give me £50. You can't go and do a transaction with this watch. Masalan, another example for this qaida. If you rent out a house and you've agreed the lease with someone for six months, you can't go back to the person and say to him, right, he's giving me £500 extra a month, get out of the house. Why? Because the agreement is already there that he's meant to rent this apartment for a minimum of six months. After the period, then you can do what you wish. Like in during this period, you cannot rent it out. Nor can you sell the house. So if you've given someone, if you're the landlord and someone has given you the rent money a year in advance or six months in advance, you can't go around and sell the house to someone else and say to them, you can move in immediately. Why is that? Why can't you sell the house? Because it is already mashkul, it is busy with something. It's busy with what? Tenant. There's someone that is already renting this item. Like the, well, the Messenger وسلم, said, An example that can be, or hadith that can be used as an evidence for this is the hadith of the Messenger وسلم, وَلَا يَبِيعُ أَحَدُكُمْ وَلَا يَبِيعُ أَحَدُكُمْ عَلَى بَيْعِ أَخِيهِ So if someone is about to buy something and they've agreed terms with the shopkeeper, you can't go to the shopkeeper and say, I'm going to pay you double fold. Why? Because you've interrupted your brother's transaction. And that's something which is prohibited. Likewise, the Messenger وسلم, said, وَلَا يَخْطُبُ رَجُلُ عَلَى خِدْبَةِ أَخِيهِ if a brother is talking to a certain sister and they've almost agreed the terms and conditions, you can't come around the corner and say immediately, right, I'm going to marry and so on and so on and then uh, corrupt his uh, or their engagement or their nikah. That is haram. That it won't be fasid, it will be haram. No, it'd be valid because the conditions are there. Like, that person has fallen into something which is haram. Right, it's sin. Huh? So he's sinning. He's sinning, he's sinning. No. Because obviously, the Messenger وسلم, prohibited a person from doing such a thing. A person is about to marry a, a sister, and then another brother comes along and interrupts and hijacks the whole nikah. It's haram. Because the Messenger وسلم, prohibited. He should, take, should get permission from the other brother first. Line 45, does it connect to which one? 41, 42. In a way, it's connected because you can be in transactions, yeah. Like in, not, not directly linked, but it can be connected to it. For example, if a person is fasting the month of Ramadan, they can't say, I'm going to fast. Mathalan, the fasting of Monday and Thursday. Why? Because it's Ramadan. This waqt is busy with Ramadan. So you can't turn around and say, well, because it's Monday today, I'm going to fast the Monday sunnah. Tayyib. The Sheikh says, Rahmatullah alayhi wa man yu'addi an akhihi wajiba lahu guju'u aw lahu guju'u in nawa mutaliba. Wa man yu'addi an the one that fulfills an akhihi an obligation. The one who fulfills an obligation from his brother then he may claim it back and ask for compensation if he intends to do so or if he initially intended for him to do so. Mathalan, an example for this, if 
a friend of yours or a brother of yours owes someone some money. مثلا, Ali is your friend. Ali owes money to Muhammad. Muhammad comes to you and says, Ali owes me a grand. You can say to Muhammad, okay, I'm going to pay you, pay you this money that Ali owes you. And you can go back to Ali and say, I paid your debt on your behalf. Therefore, you have to, you owe me a thousand pounds. You no longer owe Muhammad a thousand pounds. How can you owe me a thousand pounds? You can do that. Or, مثلاً, if a person is traveling and he's gone far and his wife and children are at home, like and he hasn't left them any money for them to do their shopping or whatever, um, he can, on behalf of his brother, buy them shopping, do everything for them, and then later on say to him, right, I've spent such and such X amount of money on your family and you need to pay me back because it was money that I provided to your family or gave to your family. Lacking with regards to zakah, then a person cannot do so without the other person intending to do the zakah. مثلا, if it's zakah, you can't pay zakah on behalf of someone else. Why? Zakah is a ibadah. And a ibadah requires niyyah, intention. And a ibadah requires intention. طيب. That is if he, طبعاً, if he intended for him to, or intended to ask for the, for whatever it was that he paid. You need the um, person's permission to do so before. Some scholars say you need the person's permission. That's why there's khilaf in this issue. Like in, I didn't go into the khilaf because maybe later on in the other courses we'll go into it. Like in, some scholars say that it, he doesn't have a right to claim or ask for it back because he can turn around and say, I never asked you to pay the money on my behalf. Yeah. yeah. yeah? And if he does so, he's well in, he's well in his right. He can say, I'm not going to pay you back. Because maybe he didn't even intend to pay this individual back. Or maybe he doesn't have money to pay him back. In which case, it's permissible for him to delay the repayment of that debt. Lakin, if he did intend to pay him, the first individual, then he can pay him, Lakin, it would be at a delayed time. Because obviously, he may not have the money to do so. Tayyip. The last line that the Sheikh mentions The natural deterrent to sins or something which is disliked is similar to the legislative or the legislation which is a deterrent for Sins In the Sharia of Islam We have uqubat We have punishments Some sins Or some acts Have a specific punishment Mathalan the, the thief His hand is to be chopped off Mathalan The zani To be lashed Or mathalan the, the, the zani Who has been through marriage To be stoned And so on So these punishments Are to be found In the Quran and the Sunnah Lakin, there are things that are prohibited to do. Lakin, there's no text from the Quran and the Sunnah stating a certain punishment. Lakin, these things naturally, people determine, people often stay away from these things. Mathalan, eating najasat or drinking najasat, things are, which are najis. It's haram. Like in there's no punishment for it Because the natural deterrent is that people Often stay away from drinking najasat Mathal and urine There's no punishment for drinking urine Like in it is haram And it is relied upon the fact that Naturally humans tend to stay away from things like that Also eating mathal or drinking poison If a person drinks poison It's haram, sah? Not in terms of wanting to commit suicide, like in just drink, drinks poison for the sake of it, it is haram. Like in there's no specific punishment. Rather, what is relied upon, what is expected, is that a person naturally stays away from these things. 
So that is the meaning of wazi' tab'i Something which is naturally a deterrent Which is naturally a deterrent yeah, Which is in a position to those acts That require a certain punishment um, Now. So for those things that don't have a certain punishment, they're haram Like in... Because there isn't a certain punishment for them A person may be... It may be left to the judge or it may be left to The person not being punished Like in it is still a sin that he is Or something which is disliked For... مثلا, a person drinking poison is what? Harming oneself And harming yourself is what? Haram la dharaga wa la dharag. There's no harming of oneself and no harming of others. The Sheikh says, Walhamdulillahi ala tamami fil badi wal khitami wa dawami. And praises, all praises due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the beginning and in the ending and always. Summa salat ma' salam in sha'i'i ala nabi wa sahbihi wa tabi'i. And then peace and salutations upon the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa sahbihi and his companions wa tabi'i and anyone that follows the messenger and the tabi and the sahaba ridwanullahi ta'ala alayhim ajma'in taban that is the last line of this short uh, these short lines of poetry by Sheikh Abdul Rahman Al-Sa'di in the science of al-qawa'id al-fiqhiyya and as planned hopefully we'll study another two times why because the more you study a book, the more you'll be grounded in it, the more you will benefit. Some of the scholars, from the students of Imam Shafi'i, some of them read Al Muz, uh, Imam Muzani, so, uh, read <coughs> Al Risala li Imam Shafi'i. Imam, Risala, Imam Shafi'i has a book called Al Risala, the first book to be written in Usul al Fiqh. His student, Al Muzani, read, I believe it was Muzani. Read the Sheikh's or uh, Risala, this book, 80 times. And on each time, he benefited something which he hasn't or which he had not previously benefited from the same book. So, hopefully, we'll study this book another two times. This time round, we were only going into the mutton or the meaning of the words of Sheikh Sa'di. <coughs> the next two times, hopefully, we'll delve a bit deeper. Um, also it's important for a person to seek knowledge Learn about his religion For knowledge isn't only for Knowledge of Islam Isn't like knowledge of worldly affairs For example if someone wants to learn medicine They'll go to the department of medicine And when you do go to the department of medicine You'll only see students start studying that field If you go to the department of engineering then you'll only find students that are studying engineering in that department, sah? طيب. And any other field. Lacking with Islam, every single Muslim is required to learn about his or her religion. The Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, طَلَبُ الْعِلْمِ فَغِيدَةٌ عَلَى كُلِّ مُسْلِمٍ Seek knowledge is wajib, fagida, wajib, upon every single Muslim. So if a person doesn't know how to pray and they're able to learn how to pray then they are sinning every time they pray incorrectly if a person cannot worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon tawheed but they have the ability to learn then they are sinning and they are blameworthy if a person has the ability to learn the sunnah of the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam the guidance of the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam like he refuses to do so then he or she will be sinning. And you're all young. There's nothing preventing you from learning the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you don't learn the religion only in order to become only to become scholars. Like you learn the religion to be able to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imam Ahmad rahmatullahi alayhi he said that a person is more in need or in need more of knowledge than food and drink. Because the life of the Muslim is always connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you're eating, you need to know the dua for eating. When, you're fin when you finish your food, you need to know the dua 
to praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you enter the bathroom, there's a dua. When you come out the bathroom, there's a dua. When you go into the masjid, there's a dua. When you're in the masjid, there's a certain salah that you pray. This salah requires you to know how to pray. And just because you're praying, it doesn't mean you're praying correctly. In an authentic hadith, a messenger, uh, in an authentic hadith of the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, a man walked into the, the masjid of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he prayed or he done what he thought was praying. And then he came to the messenger and he greeted him. And the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, alayhi wa sallam, or gave him the salam back and he said, Irja' for salli fa innaka lam tusalli. Go and return and pray for you have not prayed. The man went back and prayed or tried his best to pray. And then he came back to the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The messenger again said to him, go back and pray, for you have not prayed. And the man came back again on three occasions. On the third occasion, the man said, verily I don't know any salah other than the one I've just prayed, so teach me. Then the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught him how to pray. So the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you the ability to practice your religion whilst you're young. If you look at a lot of the elders, they only started practicing the religion of Islam when they were in their 50s, in their 60s. Lakin, you as youngsters, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you a ni'mah, a great ni'mah, which is you have the ability to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from a young age. And from the authentic hadith that have been raised from the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said that from or there'll be seven types of individuals who shall be under the shade of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, under the throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, under his shade, Yawm al-Qiyamah, when the sun is at the heads of the people. From these individuals is a young man or young woman who grew up in the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Who grew up in the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Every single one of you, brothers and sisters who are sitting here, has the ability to come under that hadith has the ability to come under that hadith. And knowledge, worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon knowledge, is like none other. It, it has a certain taste. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grants it to you, then you will know that knowledge is more precious than anything that a person can be given. You will be able to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. مثلا, it will make ibadah easier for you. You'll be able to learn method and simple acts like how to wipe your socks. When you're making wudu, when can you wipe your socks? How to wipe your socks? The time that you have to wipe your socks. When you're traveling, the fact that you don't have to fast, the fact that you know how to combine your salah, which naturally, naturally makes life easier for you. For if you're traveling, you may find it difficult to find a masjid or somewhere to pray. Like if you know that from the Sharia that you're allowed to combine the Salah, you can pray Maqrib and Isha at the same time. And then the whole night you can, you're free to do what you want. Or you can pray Asr and Dhuhr at the same time and during the whole day you can do what you want because you're traveling. So knowledge, it makes ibadah easier for you. It brings you closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if a person has good intentions, then he'll be rewarded for every single act Every single ibadah that he does. مثلا, even for a person getting married, a person can be rewarded. People end up being married 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years. Imagine being rewarded for every single day of your married life. Marriage life. Because it requires an intention. So don't be as someone who seeks knowledge one week and then doesn't seek knowledge the other week. Know that knowledge is what brings you closer to Allah subhanahu Ta'ala. Any questions by homework? Questions, go. On. There's a question here. If someone has a medical condition such as overactive bladder and they need to use the bathroom frequently and make him wudu for each salah, and making wudu for each salah can be difficult, especially when at work. In this case, can they pray despite being in the state of needing to use the bathroom? Naam, they are allowed to pray when they need the bathroom. Rather, they are allowed to pray whilst urine is dripping from them. 
Like in what is required is that a person performs wudu at the time of salah. Method, if someone's got a reactive bleed, uh, bladder, or salas al bowl, they call it in Arabic, a per- method in salat al zuhur, when the time for salat al zuhur comes in, they need to make wudu and then they can pray, even if the dirt or the urine is flowing. They can still pray. لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا وسعها. Allah subhanahu wa taala doesn't burden a soul upon over its ability. فاتقوا الله ما استطعتم فيه Allah subhanahu wa taala according to the best of your ability. لكن they must make wudu for every sana. If someone is suffering from evil eye, is it obligated or is it permissible to go to a raqi? As I have recently read in an article that is stating that ruqya clinics are not part of the sunnah. Is it also permissible to listen to ruqya audio? Um, it's permissible to go to someone to read the Quran on you. It's permissible. Ruqya is permissible. The Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa performed ruqya and Abu Sa'id al-Khudri performed ruqya. Rather, he read Quran upon a non-Muslim and he was cured. So the Qur'an is a shifa. So asking someone to read Ruqya on you is permissible. Um, as for the article that you read, uh, Ruqya clinics, maybe it was referring to those people who open up clinics in order to just take wealth from the people. So anyone that comes to them, even if they've got epilepsy or anything, they say, no, there's jinn in you. Because obviously they require this person to keep coming. Back. So people do overdo it Like in just because there are people that overdo it And use it in ways which oppose the sunnah It doesn't mean that The actual act of ruqya And going to a person can be called haram Is it also permissible to listen to ruqya audio? Naam, it's permissible to listen to it on YouTube Like in, it isn't the same as Reading Quran upon someone It won't have the same effect Just like we're meant to read Baqarah in our homes every three days what is expected is that we read. Is that we read Baqarah. Like if we don't read Baqarah and we put the tape on, it's not the same. It doesn't have the same effect. Forget about opinions. It's whatever you think is from the Sunnah of the Messenger, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Whatever you think is from the Sunnah after doing your research and looking at the statements of the scholars, whatever you think is the opinion, the correct opinion according to the Sunnah, then you do that. So nobody thinks that there's two opinions, but you don't know which one to choose. Like both, you feel like you feel inclined to both of them. You've done your research, but you don't know. Do one or the other. One, do one. Like in to do both. No, I'm lacking. Because the haq is wahid. Like with Masail al Fi Masail in the Salah and to show there's room for movement. Um earlier you mentioned a Muslim can't inherit from the Hajj. Huh? Yeah. Um so when dealing with the inheritance, can a can a kafir inherit from a Muslim? La la yaritul Muslim wa al kafir wa al kafir wa al Muslim. The Muslim doesn't inherit the kafir and the kafir cannot inherit it works vice versa. Okay. And um I've got another question. Um you mentioned the story about a person traveling uh, in Ramadan and a person um, decides to fast on the day. No, I'm there. He has to have his niya before Fajr. That when you for Ramadan, yes. you need to, for Ramadan or the wajib fast, you need to make your intention the night before. So let's say someone's traveling, they get to the place at 1 pm, they can't decide, okay, I may as well fast now. La, if it's a wajib fast. No, if it's a fast which is, oblig- which is obligatory like Ramadan, that they can't do so, okay. because fasting for the wajib Ramadan or fasting, or the intention for the fasting which is wajib has to be made the night before. But Sunnah is okay, whether they're traveling or not traveling. Father. <coughs> Do 
la when a person is doing acts of ibadah, their niyyah has to be there all the time. They have to know that they're doing it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Lakin, the fact that they're doing it every day, they're doing it because they know it is a sunnah. And they are naturally, you're expected to, you're naturally expecting to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to be rewarded for this ibadah. It is not a must that you obviously say it out loud or that you say, um, that you renew it 24-7. Like in, it's good to always know that this, this act you're doing is a ibadah and you're doing it to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and it's from the sunnah of the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam like in, if a person just does it for the sake of doing it and he doesn't know why or she doesn't know why she's doing it or it has no effect it doesn't, it doesn't feel, the person doesn't feel that they're getting closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then it's quite dangerous because it can just become a habit so a person has to be always aware and alert that what they're doing is ibadah and they're doing it to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Like inshallah they'll be rewarded for having the correct intention and doing meeting the sunnah of the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So it's mufrad here, it's singular, you said ni'mah Allah, 